Hey Squishies! Welcome back to another vlog. This is Star vs. the Forces of Evil, Episode 5. Starstruck and... I think it was just called Camping Trip. Uh, this, was, this was a good one. Uh, camping Trip was alright. Starstruck was really good. Uh, I've got a lot of kind of random things to say about it. It just... I thought about a lot of different things while watching it. Um, I'm going to start with donuts. I'm going to start with donut places throwing out their unused donuts. Uh, really, this applies to any kind of restaurant, grocery store, anything like that. They throw out a lot of stuff. Um, it's actually a real problem. Uh, in like industrialized nations, we throw out ridiculous amounts of food. There's actually enough food grown to feed the entire population of the world, and then some. But there's still people all over the world who are hungry. And part of that is because we're actually not very good at getting necessities to the people who need them. Because uh, capitalism is really good at distributing some kinds of goods and not others. And one of the things it's not so good at distributing is actually, like, calories basic necessity of survival kind of calories. It's very good at distributing, like, luxury food items. Like, the fact that I can go to the store and buy 60 cent bananas despite living thousands of miles from the nearest place that grows bananas is kind of amazing. Both that they are there at all, they're there year-round, they're that cheap, that's awesome. Don't get me wrong. But, there's also, starving people all over the world because we're not so good at getting necessities where they're needed. And part of that is that we throw out enormous quantities of food. Now, most of that is grocery stores. Most of that is grocery stores throwing away produce that is ugly. Perfectly edible, but doesn't look nice. And people will refuse to buy it, so the stores just throw it away. And some places have implemented laws that, like, if food is edible, Grocery stores aren't allowed to throw it away. They have to donate it to charity or sell it at discount or something. Uh, but most, most places in the U.S. at least, they just throw it away. Um, but with bakers, it's a slightly different problem. Like with a donut shop, for example, you're always going to have unsold stuff at the end of the day. Now, you might say, well, wouldn't the ideal to be I know I'm going to sell 200 chocolate frosted donuts today, so I'm going to make 200 chocolate frosted donuts and sell all of them. And then I know I made the right amount. Well, no, actually, you don't know that. If you make 200 frosted chocolate frosted donuts and sell 200 chocolate frosted donuts, that means odds are actually pretty good that somebody wanted a chocolate frosted donut and couldn't buy it because you were out. Because if you sold all of them, it's highly unlikely that you sold the last one to the last customer of the day. So that last customer of the day might have wanted chocolate frosted donuts and couldn't get them. Um, which means you've lost a sale of chocolate frosted donut. Now maybe they bought a different donut, maybe that somebody walked in, saw that there were no chocolate frosted donuts and walked back out. You lost the sale entirely. So what you actually want to do, uh, now I mean you've got a problem in the other direction obviously. If you make 200 chocolate frosted donuts and only sell 150, you've made way too many donuts and lost a bunch of money. The ideal is actually to make 200 fro chocolate frosted donuts and sell 198, 199. Or if you're selling 200 frosted donuts, make 201, 202, because that way you know for certain that there were no lost customers, but you don't have this large amount of unsold chocolate frosted donuts that you've wasted money making. Problem is, if you have 20 varieties of donut at your donut shop, which doesn't seem like an unreasonable number, uh, one or two of each means you've got a good two, three dozen donuts left at the end of the day. What are you going to do with them? Well, mostly you throw them out. Some places, um, especially like independent stores, will sell them at a discount the next day, like, you know, day-old donuts, you know, half price or quarter price or whatever. Some places will uh, 
find a way to recycle them in some way. Donuts, not so much, but like some bread products you can recycle the next day into, you know, pre-made sandwiches or something like that. Um, or you can donate them to a homeless shelter. I know a bagel place uh, where I used to live would do that. Uh, Main Street Bagel in Fairfax. Some of the best bagels. Like, outside of New York, possibly the best bagels you can get on the East Coast, if it's still there. I don't know. Uh, there's a place in Rockville that might be even better. But other than those two places, like, you gotta go to New York to get a good bagel on the East Coast. Um, Montreal, don't even talk. Those aren't real bagels. Anyway, um... <sighs> bagels. They would donate them to local homeless shelters, anything unsold at the end of the day. But most places throw them out, especially if it's something like donuts where it's not, you know, it's, it's a dessert, it's not exactly healthy. Homeless shelter may or may not actually take it because, like, especially if you haven't been eating a lot, that can be really bad for you to have something that's, like, super rich and super sweet. Um, so, you throw them out. And then dumpster divers will eat them, so you're sort of donating them to the homeless, in a sense, already. But yeah, um, that's my weird little rant about donuts. The main thing with this episode, I mean, to an extent, yeah, it's kind of making fun of the mentally ill in a weird way, because... Mina's behavior isn't that different um, in terms of wackiness level from typical Star or Star's dad in the very next episode. Uh, but, I mean, that's just kind of... kind of goes with the show. You know, these, these characters are weird. They are alien. Um... They're gonna behave in ways that are strange to us, and a big part of the show's humor is laughing at that. And if I'm gonna have a problem with it here, I kind of have to have a problem with it through the whole show, and... Eh. I mean... Don't get me wrong. It's a problem. But at the same time, like, it's such a bizarre caricature that it's... You can't even get mad at it. It's like... Not even vaguely any recognizable mental illness. It's just wacky weirdness with high energy. Uh, regardless, um, of course, the obvious thing that's getting parodied here is Sailor Moon. Uh, Mina has the name of, well, the American name of uh, Sailor Mars, I believe, which, if I am correct, is interesting because Sailor Mars is actually the older uh, character. Um, she was the main character of a manga that came out sometime before Sailor Moon, and that's why in early chapters of Sailor Moon she's an already established superhero um, that Sailor Moon looks up to because she was in an earlier book. Um, not Sailor Mars, Sailor Venus is what I'm talking about. That's why the V. Sorry, I got, I tripped over myself because Mina, M, but no, it was, uh, Venus, Sailor V. But her name, like her personal real name, uh, in at least the American dub, uh, was Mina. Mmm... I'm pretty sure. Anyway, there's that. She's got the uh, Odango hair, you know, the kind of balls that the pony pigtails or whatever they're called come out of. Um, the dress, the transformation sequence is dead on, uh, even though what she ends up turning into is rather hilariously different. In fact, it reminded me a lot of uh, the way Etrigan the demon is drawn 
in uh, Batman the Animated Series and uh, Justice League cartoon. That same kind of like squat looking, but actually not short, just very, very broad, very muscular, and same kind of dimensions. So that, that was, that, that, I definitely got a laugh at that. Um, and then the, kind of the last thing that comes out of that episode for me is that it's very, uh, you know, the, the instinct of the Muni warrior is to conquer this new planet. She learns that there are no rules, no rulers. Well, I'm going to come in and become the ruler. I'm going to conquer them. Um, which we've seen a bit before that Muni is pretty imperialistic. Uh, we saw that with the Thanksgiving parody, uh, I forget what it was called, but it was back in the first season, this whole, like, pageant about how Muni conquered the monsters. Um, and now we're kind of seeing the same thing here, where it's, you know, it reminds me of the Eddie Izzard bit about Europeans going around plan planting flags on things and claiming them for whatever country, you know, coming over to the Americas and planting a flag and saying, I claim this land for Spain, and the Native Americans going, uh, this is ours. And, you know, Columbus or whoever are being like, do you have a flag? No. And well, according to the rules of the game I just made up, you gotta have a flag. So, this is Spain now, because there were no flags here before. Um... Yeah, like, according to the rules of the game she just made up, she gets to conquer Earth because it's a democracy. Which, it actually isn't. There is no Earth government, but whatever. The bit of Earth she landed in is ostensibly a democracy. Um, and then you had approximately half the population being 100% willing to vote away their own freedom and vote in a tyrant. Which, um, yeah, that's kind of a thing that happened. Um, yay. So yeah, lot, lots of different things in that episode got me thinking about a lot of different things. It was, it was a good one. Camping Trip was a pretty typical Starverse episode. It had some good gags. Um... But that was about it. I'm a little unclear on the ending if the dad really was rejuvenated or just parboiled. Um, I could kind of read it either way. At first I thought it was just that he was parboiled because, you know, he was just all red and all his hair was gone. And I thought, oh, okay, he's been boiled and smoothed and so on. But then in the very final scene where he's sitting on the couch... Uh, and his beard and hair had started to grow back, he still did look a lot younger. So, I don't know? Um, I guess we'll find out next time he shows up, which I presume he will at some point. Star's parents have been fairly frequent, like, guest characters. Um, other than that, it, it was nice kind of acknowledging the thing I talked about way back when, that there are basically two kinds of episodes. The Star's world inserts itself into Earth, and the let's go out into the universe and see something weird. And it's sort of Marco acknowledging that the latter type of episode exists, and he's seen a lot of weird stuff, and he wants to show Star something impressive on Earth. Um, it kind of connects with theme I mentioned way back when, talking about the first season, that one of the themes running in this show is that Earth is really a strange and alien place, um, as much so as any other planet. And both episodes were kind of playing with that, um, that Earth is a strange and alien place to Mina. Star, by this point, is starting to adjust to it, but for Mina, it's 
completely bizarre. They do things in strange ways and have things she doesn't, you know, creatures she's never seen before and so on. Um, and then here we have a different take on it. Here we have what is a relatively familiar thing for these characters at this point. Like, Star has been out in the woods a couple times. But, like, out in the woods on Earth. So now she's starting to be the one who knows how things are on Earth. But here comes her dad. Actually, a lot like Mina in the previous episode. She, he doesn't understand. And he's making a mess of things. And kind of this unwanted tag along. And he's actually a lot like Star early in the series. Where Star is now in a little bit more of a Marco position. Of being like, why do you keep disrupting everything? Why don't you understand how things work here? Uh, frustration. And that sort of reversal kind of cum culminates in Marco being the one to show them, you know, the strange and wonderful thing that only exists apparently on Earth. So that was actually a cool way of playing with it and kind of turning around the way a lot of things worked in the first season. So actually now that I'm talking about it, I'm liking the episode more. Uh, because I'm realizing it did these interesting things. Anyway, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, still really enjoying the show. Looking forward to some more, uh, probably later this month. Hope y'all enjoyed that. If you did, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, if you want some more videos right away, you can hop over to my Patreon and see them there. Got... Other goodies there, blog posts, ability to commission videos, feel free to check it out. Bye!